Good morning and welcome to a brand new week here on Breakfast Central. Thank you very much for joining us. A lot of stories have happened over the course of the weekend. I'll be bringing you here up to speed with these stories. I am Olive Emodi. And I am Osaogi Ogbawan. Yes, Monday morning to follow up on discussions between the Nigerian um, organized labor and the federal government on what figures they will eventually be um, agreeing at. The federal government, of course, offered 62,000 naira, and uh, those are the figures that we have for now as the offers. Lego, um, Labor, I beg your pardon, has uh, turned that down, saying that it's not enough. Governors, of course, are, are part of this conversation. Will Nigerian governors be able to pay 62,000 naira minimum wage or even higher? And also the private sector. These are some of the things that we're going to be exploring this Monday morning on Breakfast Central. We also have Adebola joining us with Breakfast Headlines. Good morning, Adebola. Yes, good morning, Olive and Osawage. It's good to be here another uh, Monday morning. Uh, like you rightly said, Osawage, looking forward to what comes out. Well, uh, the government has offered 62,000 naira to organized labor. Uh, I don't know what that would pan out to. You know, I hear organized labor is pushing for 250,000 naira. Uh, let's see if a consensus can be reached at the end of the day. What is quite interesting, however, is how organized labor had asked for, how the federal government had uh, offered 60,000 naira just before they went on strike. And I remember Osagi and I talking about this on the show, saying agreeing to pay more than 60,000 naira can mean 61,000 mm. or 60,500. And NLC was like, no, uh, the government had agreed to pay something substantial. What this looks like is a ridicule on the effort of the NLC, you know, adding 1,000 or 2,000 naira. How, how do you consider that substantial negotiation? Looking mm. at how they have gone from 30,000 to, I think, 40-something thousand and 54,000, uh, before we got up to 60,000. Mm -hmm. So it just feels like they're adding ones and twos here. Although we cannot ignore the fact that an increase in the salary mm. would automatically mean an increase in the price of goods and services. It would, would see some level of inflation. I don't know how labor intends to manage all of that. I mean, but many people argue that the, when the ball was in labor's court mm. was when they had the strike last week, Monday, and they don't know what the chances would be of labor being able to enforce a three-digit figure. I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth, uh, Olive. It's a mixed tale, mixed emotions, mixed reactions. Like you rightly said, you know, mentioned, increase in the minimum wage will lead to increase in prices of goods and services, which we already have. And so we'd have much more escalating prices of goods and services. Uh, some persons say, be that as it, as it may, uh, there is a need to review the minimum wage as the average take-home of Nigerian uh, when it comes to the purchasing power of the average Nigerian is nothing to write them about. So it, it's a yeah. mixed bag of mixed balls. Uh, some persons say, yes, they need to increase the minimum wage. Uh, some persons say, you know what, you're just going to jacket or skyrocket inflation in Nigeria. Yeah, but, yeah, so, I mean, so some of the conversations that we had last week that, you know, we, of course, they expect to be developing. Labor, first of all, has given the government five days. Um, and that should be, should be expiring, today. you know, mm. is it today or tomorrow. But are looking um, at working days. Yeah, well, five working days. And, and so if, if that's the case, you know, then we, we, we then, of course, you expect that either Labour will go back to, you know, on strike mm. or negotiations will continue. Maybe they'll extend the five days. Nobody knows. So those are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. But also, you know, from last week, we did discuss the possibilities of even affording 100,000 naira. Um, the um, private sector, you know, has way more numbers than, of course, you know, the uh, um, uh, public sector, which the federal government is meant to be paying. So these things need to be considered. You know, if you're going to be agreeing on 150,000, 120,000, maybe even 200,000 that labor is asking for, the private sector must be considered. Not very many companies can afford to pay 200,000 hour minimum wage, um, um, you know, across board. I did see a few people on social media say, and these are people who own, you know, some things as as poultry, yeah, saying that if, that if um, minimum wage is increased to 100,000, that they will start selling a crate of eggs for 10,000 naira because they need to afford salaries. They need to afford running costs, you know, of their businesses. And so these are things that will be affected. I remember we also had conversations last week where people, one of our guests mentioned that labor should change its focus from demanding an increment in salaries to demanding that certain things, you know, that should lead to a reduction in the cost of living be put in place. You know, if refineries need to be fixed, if certain infrastructure needs to be put in place, if the economy needs to be tackled by the government to reduce the cost of living, that maybe those things will be more effective, um, you know, instead of demanding an increment, you know, in salaries. So it's, it's, it's a pretty confusing state that we are, you know, and I don't know what the federal government itself 
and the National Assembly because they should be a part of this conversation. They seem to be very quiet. Um, what decisions that they need to come together to, and you know and make um, with regards going forward. But this week obviously would bring a lot more. We have uh, some of these discussions. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines. I am Adebola Adeduba. The headline begins in the west of the continent where Nigeria's federal government has unveiled a lineup of events to celebrate this year's Democracy Day. Details were announced in a notice issued by Abdul Hakim Madeoye on behalf of Director of Information and Public Relations and the Office of the Secretary of the Government of the Federation. The festivities will kick off on Tuesday, June 11, with a symposium at the State House Conference Center, Presidential Villa in Abuja, starting at 9 a.m. Later that evening, a youth conference will be held at Ladi Kwali Hall, Abuja Continental Hotel, beginning at 6 p.m. On Wednesday, June 12, the celebrations will feature a grand parade at Eagle Square, Abuja, commencing at 8 a.m. The day will conclude with a dinner at the State House Banquet Hall, Presidential Villa, Abuja, at 6 p.m. In the meantime, President Bola Tinubu has appointed Dr. Nkiruka Madwekwe as the Director General and Chief Executive Officer of the National Council on Climate Change. The announcement was made in a State House press release on Sunday, signed by the Special Advisor to the President on Media and Publicity, Ajuria Ngalale. In addition to her new role, Dr. Madwekwe will serve as co-chairperson of the Intergovernmental Committee on the National Carbon Market Activation Plan. President Bola Chinubu has expanded the Presidential Committee on Climate Action and Green Economic Solutions, are the new members to bolster its efforts. Initially, the president named 26 members to the committee on May 19th, 2024, with himself at the helm. However, a statement released on Sunday by Shegun Emohisin, Director of Information and Public Relations, announced additional members. The new appointment includes representatives from the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning, the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Resources, the Federal Ministry of Inf Innovation and Science and Technology, and the NNPCL. Away from that, the parish priest of St. Thomas Catholic Church, Zaman Dabo community in Zango Katef local government area of Kaduna State, Reverend Father Gabriel Oke has been kidnapped by bandits. He was said to have been abducted by the bandits in the early hours of Sunday. A statement by the Vice General of the Kafanchan Catholic Diocese Reverend Father Emmanuel Kazan solicited prayers for the immediate and safe release of the abducted priests. The National, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency says its operatives have again intercepted another consignment of 175,000 bottles of opium imported from India. And this comes barely a week after seizing a shipment of 175,000 bottles of codeine based syrup at a Port Harcourt sports complex in Orne River State. The two seizures, according to the statement by the NDLEA spokesperson, Femi Baba Femi, followed earlier intelligence, which made the agency request that the ship shipment be stepped down for 100% examination. The death toll from a recent attack by suspected Islamist rebels in eastern DR Congo has tragically risen to 41. The update was provided by Congolese Army spokesman, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Hazuke, who disclosed that the attack carried out on Friday was the work of the Allied Democratic Forces, a militant group now based in eastern Congo. The ADF, which has pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, frequently launches attacks, further destabilizing an already volatile region populated by numerous militant groups. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to your Saogi and Olive. Thank you very much. Um, we, of course, continue to have very, very sad records of um, um, priests and reverend fathers and Christians uh, being attacked in northern Nigeria. They're not the only victims, you know, but um, every time that we hear one of these stories about a church leader or a reverend father, it continues to put Nigeria in a very bad light with regards to um, re um, religious freedom. Um, and so, you know, prayers for, you know, that Reverend Father in Kaduna State that has been uh, kidnapped once again by bandits. And we're hoping that he comes back home safe um, to his, uh, his family. Um, I'm hoping that the Kaduna State government, of course, knows what must be done and, you know, deploys every available resource 
to bring him back home. Absolutely, Osaoge. We're hoping, I mean, uh, security operatives stepped up, you know, beef of security and try to investigate and, you know, get him back, you know, out there alive. All right. Adebola, thank you for bringing us the uh, breakfast headlines. See you at 9 a.m. You're welcome. And now it's time for us to get into the meat of today's conversations right after this break. A group of traders in Plata State have called on the state government to make the availability of conducive shopping structures for their daily transactions top priority. This call came when New Central's crew visited Terminus, the just main market, to see the level of compliance by traders whom government had relocated from the roads to a temporary place for their transactions. According to the government, this development is for their safety, as well as the beautification of the city center, especially within the Jos Bukuru metropolis. New Central's Chizoba Anyongwe tells us more. This is the popular Jasmine Market Terminus, which got burnt many years ago. Before the inferno, Terminus was a huge revenue earner, thereby improving the economy of Plateau State. But now, this is what is left of it. A few weeks ago, Government Executive Order 3 caught up with some traders who moved their businesses to the roadside and under makeshift structures as against the warnings of government since last September. Those structures have been demolished and the traders ordered to temporarily relocate here, just beside the burnt market. This development still doesn't sit well with these traders who are back on the roads again. We're not that happy because when the fire we're waiting, children go eat. And this thing can't happen like this. We're not going to fight. And we're not going to call anybody. We see all of us here. They are only giving us pipe shops. And the shop is not with us. They are not even sure us the place yet. That's why. They will say they can't go inside. Some is even when crossing, they will see what they wanted to buy. So they will stay and buy. That's why we still here on the road. Despite the dangers associated with this kind of roadside transactions, this is what the affected traders have to say. Please, we are calling the government in order to look into it. They provide space for us, but the space that they provide, the head, as in the people that they are in head of us, are not giving us the space. It's only when you know someone before they will give you space here, or you pay money. They never give us the place you go vacate. So now I make everybody jam on the road now. Yes. So if they give us the place you go stay, we're not going to stay here again. This condition now, we, uh, we spend more than 20 years here. We are selling market, and government said that we should park inside. We are about to park inside. They are there selling the place to others while they are not here. Behind me now is where government has temporarily relocated these traders for their safety and also for the beautification of the city centre. However, they still prefer, some of them actually still prefer to be on the roadside, saying that that is where their customers will easily locate them for their businesses. But how this pans out with the plans of government is what everybody is waiting patiently to see. From the Jasmine Market for New Central, Chizoba Anyoui. And, you know, very interesting there from Chizoba Anyo. It's not, you know, it, it, it's not the first time we're seeing things like that. And I think that has happened in many parts of uh, the country where the government, um, you know, sees a security risk or, you know, humanitarian risk and, and then tries to move people away from that location into, a, you know, more suitable location, mostly, you know, marketplaces like this. But they always come back. Um, and there's many reasons that they've given. You know, if you listen to everyone who spoke there, they pretty much were saying the same thing that they recognize the fact that the government has provided a space for them to trade their goods, but there's people who, you know, are supposedly responsible for the allocation of those, you know, um, spaces that seem to be selling it off or giving it to specific people. And so it is no longer, you know, within the reach of these people who we're speaking with. So, and I'm guessing it's the same thing with every other person who's there, because they all said the same thing. Um, and that calls for the, you know, so the need for some level of regulation or for government to, of course, step in and ensure that every one of these people gets, you know, um, you know, a shop, you know, in a more safe and a more secure environment for them to do their business. But there's a thing that I should also mention, you know, I think all of you know, maybe we'll chip in, you know, um, here. Um, one of the reasons that as much as, you know, people would say, oh, it's wrong to break laws, you know, it's wrong if the government has said that it's illegal 
to trade here. One of the reasons you find people still having to do that, you know, aside the reasons that they've mentioned, is, is you know, is, is just it's a condition that many people find themselves, you know, and they have to figure out ways with which to survive, you know, sometimes illegal, sometimes, you know, um, 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 legal ways. And it made me remember um, one thing that I have seen in the last two weeks, which is stories of people, you know, people make videos of um, um, manholes, you know, on the express road or certain things that were, you know, part of road infrastructure that you, you know, the government puts there. And then two weeks later, you realize that, you know, criminals have come and removed Still those things, you know, to sell them, you know, off here and there. Um, which is, you know, completely criminal and they should be arrested. But, you know, people have also mentioned, you know, that you know, there's a level of poverty that, you know, you find in the society that people almost don't have any choice, but they need to figure out ways to survive. Um, it's not excusing, you know, criminal behavior. It's not excusing damaging government property. It's not excusing, you know, um, stealing government property or any of that. And, you know, and of course, if you do that, you should be arrested. But it, it, the point is, when... When these people find themselves in these types of situations, you find them breaking the law. And right. so, you know, as much as, you know, government tries to help, you know, I think that there should be a thorough uh, process with regards to relocating these people. When it comes to conversations regarding roadside shopping, I don't think that is just Plateau State that has tried to regulate roadside of shopping. Of course not. Even here Even in Lagos. Even here in Lagos, yeah. right? But the one thing that we must always remember is that the role of government is to make life better for the citizens. It's important that you do not come to make life harder. And I get the whole beautification. I mean, we saw what Oshodi was like before government intervened and made it look somewhat decent, right? Uh, back in the day, many, many years ago, Oshodi was not what it is today. So I completely get that. And I know that sometimes to get the desired change, we're going to take some very difficult steps. But right now, it's a very rough time in Nigeria. It's a very, very rough patch. People are struggling to make ends meet. So I think the fair thing, in the interest of fairness, is if government is ensuring or saying that you should, these people should stop shopping by the roadside, maybe government should be the one to facilitate the distribution of the stalls and ensure yeah. that it gets to everyone. Yeah. Because you can't say that you're going to leave that and not, I mean, you can't say stop at saying, oh, we provided stalls for you and that's it. We know how these things are. People will politicize it. Some people will try to make extra money yeah. from the stores to say, oh, if you want to get premium store close to the road, you know, pay extra. People will try to manipulate it. And now, now more than ever, Nigerians don't need anything that will make life a lot harder for them. Yeah. Especially those who are the, uh, you know, these market women and petty traders. How much, how much can these people really make in a day? Some of them, at the very most, they are making like 10,000 naira a day because they are doing like petty sales for some of, of them. That's a lot of money. I'm in sure in this day and age, 10,000. I'm, I'm just saying. That much. Yeah, but if we say 10,000 a day, that's like 310,000 in a month. And they won't sell everything. A lot of these people don't some make days, that much. Do you get? So you know, that is... the money they are making is too small. For them to be for them to go through what they're actually going through so it, it's very important that whilst we applaud the government for trying to make plateau state uh you know look very beautiful we also know that the nigerians need to feed they need to have a decent quality of life so if you're taking them away from the streets and creating alternatives for them please go a step further and ensuring that the stalls get to the people who you know who, who, who need, need them. them. Yeah, I agree. And of course, this is this is local government level. I believe it's not even. I don't even think it's you know the state, state government here. Yeah, this is you know some of the things that local government council, local government you know um, um, offices should be able to handle um, because they, of course, you know run market responsible for marketplaces and and some of all these extras. Um, it, it, it's it's fair and you know it's a good thing that you provided you know the stores you know for these people. But like you said go a, a step further, you know, ensure that there's proper regulations through which these people can, have, can get access to these stores. If they need to come to local government office, register, get, you know, you know, a, a key allocated to them, you know, to their store in the market, then let them do that. You know, just, just those extra steps that need to be taken to ensure that, you know, they, they're not denied a store because they can't pay or they're not denied, you know, a, a store because, you know, they don't know somebody who's high up there in the market regulation. There's just too many of these persons who infuse themselves or who put themselves, you know, into, I mean, you see it in Lagos, you know, in the motor parks and, and whatnot, you know, a couple of people who take the responsibility of government, you know, to then run these places, you know, and they're not remitting any money back to the, you know, to the, to the state government or to the local government. So those individuals, you know, eventually then become a clog in the wheel of progress, you know, um, for government. So um, as much as we applaud the, the Plateau State government and any other government who's trying to make 
um, you know, environment more conducive for living and for doing business. You know, I think that you, like you said, they should go and take you know a couple of steps further to just to ensure that uh, things are done the right way. Um, but you know, it, thanks to Chizobanyo way for that report because those are the kind of things that we hope would get to the you know the, um, right the eyes and the ears yeah. of the Plateau State Government too, so they understand what is going on in the um, in those places and you know, the changes that they are trying to make in those locations. They understand what. Uh, how those things are turning out. But let's move away and talk about some other things. The Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, has filed a lawsuit against the government of President Bola Tinubu over its failure to publish spending details of the loans obtained by the government of former presidents uh, Molushego Basanjo, Umaru Musayaradua, Goodluck Jonathan, and Mohamed Buhari. The suit was filed against the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wali Edu and the Debt Management Office. Serap is asking the court to direct and compel the Tinubu government to publish the loan agreements obtained by the former administrations. Now, what Serap is also pushing at is the fact that transparency when it comes to dealings with loans is very important. You know, it's stated that citizens deserve the right to know how public funds are being spent, that it's fundamental for a democratic process and uh, for accountability. And that's what they are asking for. They're saying, show us exactly what was used. They are agreeing that transparency in loan, is, uh, loan agreements and expenditures is a very, very important part of um, executing a transparent government. And <clears throat> like we always talk about how there is a breach of trust between Nigerians, between the government and the governed. And one way to breach that would be to ensure that there's some level of transparency when questions like these are asked. This was filed last week Friday at the High Court. Um, when... Questions like this are asked. It's important that the government steps forward with clarity to sort of remove whatever shadow of darkness exists there and explain. Uh, whether or not the Tinubu administration would respond to this uh, is something that we are, we are only just going to have to wait to find out. Yeah. You know, but you, you, you cannot, you know, overstate the importance of this. You know, and even, even if not waiting for SERAP, you know, there's the Freedom of Information Act, you know, that every Nigerian has, um, uh, you know, at its disposal to use to seek the you know these bits and pieces of information the the challenge here is the lack of accountability between government and citizens for serap to get to this level for serap to even put this information out there it's not because serap is the first person thinking about it a lot of nigerians generally um have their doubts with regards how these loans have been used and yes. have been spent they also have their doubts as to even, you know, their bacha um, uh, loots, loots that you know, that returned. of course are returned to Nigeria, how those funds have been Oftentimes utilized. Sometimes they are joke, they joked, uh, joked about that these loots that are returned are being are re looted. So there is that, you know, th there is, you know, that huge trust deficit. And a, a lot of, you know, the reasons are centered around lack of, you know, sincerity and lack of clarity, lack of transparency between government and citizens. Um, lack of a proper auditing process also. Um, because, you know, a lot of these figures, you know, I know that there's the Auditor General's office that should put out, you know, its, its report at the end of re every year. But I don't remember that there's been any time in the last decade and more, in fact, in the last 30 years, that we've seen the Auditor General's report come out and they point out some of the things that are, you know, they're, they're just some facts and figures that just don't make any sense, that the government has then taken action. I know that there have been some really, really shocking um, um, revelations by the Auditor General's report in the last couple of years that were simply ignored. And so, if that trust deficit is not um, um, and fixed, then of course, Sarah will continue to sue and Nigerian citizens will continue to, to ask questions. One of the things that we're going to be talking about today is the 21 billionaire that has been spent on the vice president's house. Nigerians generally, so, and this is not saying that there's been anything found to be wrong with those figures, but I can tell you for free that Nigerians generally do not believe that that building cost 21 billion. And uh, the sad part about this is that we're setting a precedence that would mean that even when the government acts with the true intention and with honesty, the citizens would definitely doubt. It's that doubt that we've seen permeate different sectors of our government. It's what would sort shine through at the elections. It's what we see in everyday policies that are being implemented. Even when the Senate even comes out with their intention to push certain bills, there's yep. still a breach of trust. Oh. So we, 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 we need to be able to breach that deficit. And the way that we can 
bridge that deficit is by clearance, you know, by being clear and transparency. transparent. You know, being able to say this is exactly what we got, this is exactly how we used it. Don't forget the reason yeah. Senator Ningi was suspended. Exactly, because he, he, he was some sort of a whistleblower about yep. budgets being padded. Till today, no investigation has been carried out regarding that. Was that budget padded? Is that the end of it? Yeah. We really don't right. know what exactly it is. Anyway, uh, we'll be bringing more updates on that story as we get there. But let's move away. Uh, we'll go on a very quick break. And when we come back, there are more conversations to look at this morning. Stay with us. You're welcome back to Breakfast Central. Minimum wage negotiations between the organized labor, the organized private sector, and the federal government ended in a gridlock on Friday as the federal government proposed 62,000 naira up from an initial offer of 57,000 naira through the labor, though the labor unions are still pushing for a higher amount of 250,000 naira. The Nigerian Governors Forum stated that if a 60,000 naira minimum wage is adopted, many states would allocate the entire federal um, account allocation committee funds to salaries leaving no resources to develop uh, developmental projects. Now, reacting to this on Saturday, the organized labor faulted the Nigerian Governors Forum's position, saying every part of the new minimum wage agreement should be implemented, and any of the state governors who can't pay it should resign. Joining us this morning is the NLC PRO Lagos State, Ismail Ishola Adejumo. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning for having me on uh, News Central this morning. It's my Good pleasure time. to always be here. All right. Let's first of all start with your um, response to the Nigerian Governors Forum, asking that you know, you know, anyone who cannot pay it should resign. Don't you think that they have a point? You know, the fact allocation that they receive every month, if they double what their recurrent expenditure should be, um, it's going to take a lot, you know, from them. And you know, I mean, the state is almost no longer going to have enough money to do any other thing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... As much as you know, the facts and figures are the public domain. Everybody is, uh, you know, the facts are available before everybody. And uh, if any governor at this time or the forum of the governors are saying they cannot even implement the initial 60,000 before the government now, the tripartite committee now push it to 62, which is not our own benchmark or expectation for, from them whatsoever. So I think uh, something is wrong somewhere. And I, you agree with me that too much is given, much is expected. And I said it earlier on in one of the uh, program that since the subsidy removal has been removed, most of these governors are receiving almost times 10 of the allocation. Some of them, even before the subsidy removal, were paying uh, their wage bill in the range of uh, some states, not generally now, within the uh, range of five, six billion. But some of them now, what they receive only as federal allocation, apart from the IGR, is to the tune of almost 25 billion monthly. So how can any governor justify this? They need to come clean and come to the table. They should not run from the negotiation that is ongoing. The tripartite committee, they are part of the committee. They should lay their card on the table, let everybody see, analyze it critically, and vis-a-vis -vis the current uh, inflation rate. Before the removal, we know the inflation rate was not at this astronomical level. So if government, any governor or the forum of governor are saying this, they are trying to... Ab uh, Mr. Dejimon, we seem to <clears throat> be struggling with uh, your connection this morning. And to uh, put down, it's a okay. way of redistributing the wealth to other people. The people, the paper seller, the market woman, or even the landlord, everybody will have a bit of this uh, money. Yeah. So it's going to trip down, and it's a way of re eradicating poverty. Poverty yeah, but, you know, the, 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 the idea of it side. trickling down, you know, just, just to be clear, you know, when you're talking about it trickling down, you know, we, we also need to bear in mind that there's also the private sector. It's not just, you know, the public sector, you know, that needs to be affected by this increment. Um, and you also are aware that, you know, many state governors struggle to even pay the 30,000 hour minimum wage when it was moved from 18 to 30,000. So, you know, it, 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 it might seem like, you know, a completely Herculean task asking that they then pay 60,000 or 100,000 hour minimum. We haven't even agreed on what the figure would be. Uh, thank you very much. You know, immediately the uh, subsidy was removed. The uh, uh, private employers, I mean the organized private sector, they jack up the price of their services and goods in the market. You know how much a, a, a bottle of Coke 
is sold for now. Even malt and some other goods like that. A, a tuba of yam now goes for as high as 4,005, 4,000 naira. A tuba, to the extent that so. Um, Mr. Dejumo, we seem to have some challenges with the network. Are you still with us? Yes, I'm very much with you. All right, it's only the, the, the working class, the Hello? Yes. Um, so it seems that we've, we're having some sort of challenge with the network this morning, but you've shared with us how the organized private sector have jacked up their prices. Are you still there with us? I'm very much with you. All right. They have jacked it up initially, and there is need for government to shift ground, and that is why they quickly do what they call wage award, to augment that income. It's so stagnant and it's so meager. I cannot even buy anything. The purchasing power of a Nigerian worker has been uh, uh, declined. Okay. And the inflation has eroded everything. So what why be, uh, are we now going to be productive? How are we now going to be very committed to duty? How are we going to, you know, meet up our own status? Yeah. Uh, how are you going to then handle the conversation about the inflation still getting worse? As the numbers are going up with regards to the offer that the government is making to organize labor, it has been said that the organized private sector will, of course, have to see an increase in the uh, prices of goods and services. Therefore, an inflation is bound to happen. So how does, how do you, what do you make of this? And how do you think that we can, you know, make the best of the impending in inflation? Whatever it is now, you're talking about yam being 4,000, it most likely will get worse. So how do we then make the best of the situation that we found ourselves? Right. Um, we are still trying to connect with uh, Ismail Ishala Adejumo, who is the NLC PRO Lagos State Council. And uh, I believe that he's back with us now. Please go ahead. Ha. The, the, the organized private sector and the public sector, uh, the government side, knows quite all right that the inflation was not at this rate. And what trickled the inflation high was the, the, this policy of uh, subsidy removal and the uh, floating of Naira. So now they have to do something urgently. The, the labor leadership are not saying per se that it has to be 494. Now they, we have shifted ground now to 250,000, and the government is offering a partial 2,000 to, 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 to this is, uh, initial 60,000, which is not sustainable. But for their own, for their own luxury, they, it is it's sustainable for them to use almost 90 something billion for entertainment, the governor forum, and even the, the legislature too. Look at the rate at which they have increased their own budgetary allocation. What are they really calling Nigerians? Some of them are rising up now to, to lend voice to the, the, the call by Nigerian labor leadership that they must do something urgently because at this point now, Nigerians are frustrated. And at the time, they will be aggressive. And expectation, frustration, aggression can lead to something. But do you agree? Know. But they should not put the workers to the wall. They should um, do something meaningfully that will sustain an average workers. Whilst I agree yeah. that the policies that were uh, implemented, the subsidy removal, the flotation of, of the Naira, all of that had an impact on inflation. Do you agree that even with the increase in the minimum wage, that there's going to be further inflation? Definitely there will be inflation, and uh, the, the government have a lot of uh, measures for controlling inflation. Do you and have so an idea what these measures may be? Because so yeah, far, it hasn't really been able to potentially... to control or regulate inflation as much as we would have, the average Nigerian would have expected it to be. So do, do, how do you foresee the government is going to handle this? The, infl the inflation is at this moment because already it's, the money, the large chunk of the nation resources is going to a few hands. It's not properly distributed. It's not evenly distributed. That is why there is this disparity in inequality in society. And there is a great uh, gap, a wide gap between the rich and the, the, the downtrodden Definitely, inflation will be on the high side. Government need to do something to redistribute these uh, nation resources to go through the legitimate channel so that people can really, uh, purchasing power of the people can be improved. And inflation will come down a bit. That is the simple logic, simple arithmetic. Oh, but wow. at this time now, the, the, the huge amount of the nation resources is in the hand of the, the few elites yeah, who are I, the ruling class. I don't know if it happens just and like some that. Some of them have already dollarized this money into foreign currency. So this 
and yeah. all these measures, both fiscal and monetary policy of government, need to be reviewed. They need to do something concrete to make sure that there is sanity in the monetary and the fiscal policy of government. Because the, 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 the people who are doing below the change and some other who are in, into illicit uh, trading are already mopping funds from the economy. Yeah. And that is why few money, is, uh, huge amount of money is in the circulation, but it's not reflecting the life of an average Nigerian. Yeah. I don't know if it happens just like that. They are sharing you know, that trillions you... every month. Yeah. Trillions are being shared, uh, which is distributed from the local state government to the local government. What are they doing with this money? They are yeah. saying they're hold on. Uh, Finally, hold uh, on. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it happens just like that, you know, that once you increase purchasing power, inflation, you know, starts to reduce. Yeah, it, it may not play out just like that. Um, but I, I also want to, you know, ask you, you know, you have given the, the government five days um, uh, before, of course, you know, you would either maybe return back to your strike um, um, after it was suspended. Um, tell us what happens next. If in the next, I mean, when the five days expires and the government still doesn't give you a figure that the organized labor is comfortable with, do you return back to you know your indefinite strike, or you know would there maybe be an extension? That's one. And then um, another thing is, um, what do you what do you foresee as you know the government's you know plan? You know for oh not not that one. Another thing is, there's been arguments as to whether labour should redirect its focus from instead of demanding higher minimum wage. So demanding that the Nigerian government does all it can to reduce the cost of living, to diversify our economy, to improve on crude oil production, to, and, and some of all these things. So do you agree that labor maybe should redirect its focus from instead of fighting for increased minimum wage to fighting that the government reduces you know, the cost of living? So if you can address those two th uh, things, what happens after you your five me. days expires? And then the second question. Let me take one after the other. Yeah. The first one is the issue of uh, how, where do we go from here? Uh, you know, in the labor circle, we have hierarchies and uh, organs that you know take decisions before government uh, uh, engagement. At this very critical moment, the leadership have already met. They have reviewed and they have already given a window to Mr. President, who is the commander in chief, the CEO of this country to look at the proposal from the tripartite committee. Because you know when the negotiation was ongoing, it was the president that called on the minister of finance and the college minister for economy to quickly work out a template that will show, a, that will show clearly the picture of what the wage bill will look like. And that will give him an insight to say, okay, from this agitation and from what is on ground, we can able to shift ground from this uh, point A to point B or point C. And the leadership so much believe in the president being an activist, they've reposed some confidence in him that he will do the needful at this very uh, critical uh, time in our nation to ensure that at least the workers who he have already promised that they will have a, a living wage, we have something close to living wage, if not even wage. Because at this time, nobody can survive with that. And we are, it is that window that we have now. The moment the president makes his final pronouncement, the leadership will meet again and analyze and take decision as to the way forward. As to the area of uh, the diversification of the economy that we should look inward instead of the continuous uh, agitation for minimum wage. Before now, we have been trying to match government policy to policy in terms of this tax, tax, tax regime. When the issue of uh, electricity tariff was introduced, we staged a protest and we call on Nigeria to join us. Even as part of our demand now, it's still one of the, the cardinal demand that that increase in tariffs should be reviewed downward because that one will affect everybody, both the working class and not working class. The people who are in the small, uh, small uh, businesses, how can they survive? How much uh, electricity will you use? Even petrol, which is the alternative source of power, is not affordable. Some are selling now as a rate of 8, 850, 900 in some places, even 1,000, as the case may be. So we urge government to reduce this tax, 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 policy, which will cripple, you know, the purchasing power of Nigerians. And at the same time, diversify, as you have said. This issue of diversification, I don't think is something that we need to be agitating for. Again, government knows quite all right that they need to diversify into the critical sector of the economy by investing heavily in agriculture, provide security for farmers in the rural so that they can produce foods. 
that will come to the urban that will reduce this inflation. If that is not done, then we are in for serious uh, mess. And at the same time, government should also look at to block the loopholes in the public sector. We have some of you know, but these things are not being these things are not being it, mentioned in any of the conversations Labour is having. It is part of our demand. When we issue a communique, there is what we call extract from the communique. That is what you press always do along. But the full demand analysis of our agitation and in our communique, and I can tell you point blank that before now we have been telling them that they need to look inward into the area of the economy. The macro and the macroeconomic policy must be must be rejected. And the people who are at the ends of the affair in this economy management, they are one of the best brains we have in Nigeria, but we don't know why we are here today, where people cannot survive. So they need to divert, invest into area of uh, agriculture critically. It's very important. Then uh, medium, uh, small and medium uh, businesses, SME, uh, MSMEs, they need to also do something to assist them so that businesses can strive. Then if taxes are reduced, then businesses will strive. This task is too much. It's killing businesses. And that is why the organized labor is also telling government to block the loopholes and reduce the cost of governance. The how much they are spending on the legislature and the executive and judicial arms of government is far, far outrageous. Right. And it's, will, it's will spending you be, on the economy. Will you be disappointed? You know, I mean, I know you've described Mr. President as an activist and you trust, you know, that he would uh, act accordingly. Will you be disappointed, you know, if the president doesn't, you know, um, go further than 62,000 or even, you know, consider your demands? Actually, I will still say it categorically that we'll give Mr. President benefit of doubt. He's I know about as our father. If, the father if, of if, the nation. If, if he doesn't. Not, I, will not, I will not stand there and preempt him. Okay. I will rather. No, it's not, it's not preempting him. It's, it's how you would feel. I'm asking how you would feel if he doesn't. Would you be disappointed in the president? Actually, what would bring disappointment is when Mr. President did not shift ground okay. as much as we expected because we have a threshold. We have a benchmark we are looking at. And he also understands with us that for workers to survive in Nigeria, it's nothing, it's nothing close to what the Trapatai Committee is proposing at this moment. He knows quite all right. And Mr. President is, is somebody that is passionate about Nigerians. And his antecedent can uh, attest to this fact that he has been there when he was the governor in Lagos, he ran a progressive government. And at this time, at the federal level, we want him to take the plight of workers very seriously because we are the engine room of government. And uh, if there is going to be any progress in governance, the working class, the, the workers must be well taken care of. And I know the president will not disappoint Nigerians and the workers All right. on um, this issue. I want us to go back very quickly to the strike that happened on Monday last week. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation, George Akumi, had referred to that strike or the action taken by the organized labor as a, 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 a economic sabotage and a treasonable felony. I want to find out your reactions to that. And also because if things don't go as planned and we have to see another strike, are we expecting to see another shutdown of the national grid? Are we expecting to see the shutdown of the airports as well? Seeing that this is being referred to as treasonable felony and economic sabotage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, economic sabotage or treasonable felony is uh, what we tag our action as. But the labor movement does not enjoy going on strike. As you could see right now, you can observe that we have been very, very tolerant. We have been magnanimous. We are very, very patriotic about this country. We are partner in progress. No workers, no leadership of the labor movement will allow Nigeria to crumble on the basis of agitation for increased wage or any other condition of service. But be that as it may, it does not mean that the leadership should abuse or underrate the collective resolve of Nigerian workers. Because when a worker are united, they can never be defeated. Even when you observe when they, we withdraw our service across the nation, you see what happened. We know what it means in terms of economic uh, backwardness. The, 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 the Nigerian nation lose nothing less than almost 50 billion on that day, if not more, for just that single day. That will have amount to using it to do something productive in the economy. So do you think and, that and, if Labour had an opportunity to do things differently, do you think that Labour would have done it differently or told the same path? The, the only part we are going to tread now is to ensure that we do more of constructive engagement with the government. We have put our card on the table. Indices, parameters, and statistics are on the table. 
to justify what we are demanding for. Before now, government have not give us a breakdown of what we, what makes up that sixty two thousand as minimum wage. The the breakdown they give is not justifiable. And as for those who are calling on a treasonable felony, let, 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 let them arrest all Nigerians and the workers and lock up in the cell. Does, does constructive the engagement are, working, are not robots? The people who are working in all the critical sector are not robots. They are human beings. Does, cons alone, does constructive own, engagement they, 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 mean that if the government doesn't move further than 60,000 or 62,000, that labor will, you know, maybe find reasons to not go on strike? You know, they will continue the engagement, they will continue deliberating with, with the government. The, the last instrument we have in the labor uh, force is strike action. Before we embark on strike, we give notice, we give ultimatum, we do protest, we do all sorts of, we use all sorts of instruments. But the last result is the strike action, which we don't enjoy in any form. You can trace the history. Oftentimes they'll say, hey, before 12 midnight, what labor we, we call it up. When there are genuine reasons, why well, we should not put our economy in a, in a very uh, shaking ground? We have to compromise our time to let things move. But now that they are trying to, 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 to strangulate us, to make us suffocate, honestly, I don't know. The last result will be determined by the leadership. Because All I'm right. here as a, state, as a sports person for the state. I'm not to determine what, ne what next line of action will be taken by the leadership. All as right. soon as they take action, we comply totally 100%. Ismail Ishala Dejumal, the NLC PRO Lagos State Council. Thank you very much for your time with us this morning. It's my pleasure always to be with you on the New Centre. Thank you day. very much. Welcome back and thank you very much for joining us on Breakfast Central. Now let's share with you what the big stories are making the headlines today and joining us to review the papers is Public Affairs Analyst Dayemi Saka. Good morning. Good to have you. Good morning, Holly. It's nice to hear. Yeah. Yes, how, how are you doing? Very well. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Uh, not only is Dayemi Saka going to be reviewing the papers, we also want your thoughts. The phone lines are officially open. Please call to react to any of the stories. Remember that before you call, you need to turn down the volume of your TV set. Now let's begin a conversation this morning with the Punch newspaper. On the front page of the Punch newspaper this morning, fuel foods lead as imports hit 12 trillion naira. Manufacturers import 1.5 trillion raw materials. Food import gulps 921 billion naira. Nigeria gets 19 trillion naira forex from crude oil, solid mineral exports, others. EU raises Schengen visa fee to 90. Wow. <laughs> All right, 90 euros. Uh, vandalism, federal government. Meanwhile, I need to mention, I, I saw an article, I'm not quite sure what the number was, or how much they made last year from rejected Schengen visa fees from last year alone, 2023. I should probably look for that. Mm -hmm. uh, vandalism, federal government heightened security on Third Mainland Bridge. Democracy Day, federal government to hold parade and youth summit and dinner. Police students, 25 others abducted on Abuja Nasarawa Highway. Local refining may crash petrol price to 300 naira per litre, um, according to modular refineries. States work on total electricity subsidy removal and new tariff. Marketers register with Dangote Refinery ahead of loading. And final story, minimum wage talks end today. Labor awaits Tinumbu's nod. And, okay, yeah, this is one more. Reps to meet governors as Boronu opposes state police. That's all we have on the punch. Let's head to this Nigeria. All right, this Nigerian newspapers this morning. Big story there says, uh, MDA is struggling to pay salaries over 50% operating uh, surplus deduction. Trade associations, workers want policy reversal. Experts urge federal government to peg policy at 20% in first instance. Sarap sues federal government over ex-president's failure to account for loans. And also police storm criminals hideout in FCT, Kaduna Forest, as they arrest suspects. How Kano Governor Yusuf paid 1.3 billion naira NECO NBAIS incurred from Gandhiji's administration. And we can also find here vandalism, federal government tax insecurity on third Mailand Bridge. Picture on the screen there, President Bulatinibu, the FCT Minister Yosem Wiki, Minister of State for the FCT Maria, Maria Mahmoud, and uh, others at the inauguration of engineering infrastructure in Guzapi District in Abuja at the weekend. Um, some of the things that make people say Yasum Wiki is best performing minister. <laughs> well, these are the stories on this Nigeria. Let's go to the Daily Independent and see what we can find. All right, on the front page of the Daily Independent, despite CBN assurances, three banks show signs of distress, according to analysts. Please, they should tell us early. Let's quickly go and move our money. <laughs> And they want to kill those banks. Eh? They want to kill those banks. Eh? Well, we're seeing that 
Anal analysts are the ones saying that there are some signs, some banks showing signs of distress. We know that Heritage Bank is one down, um, and um, and I, NDIC is handling that. So we don't know. CBN is telling us to calm down. For now, I'll go with what CBN is saying. But please, you should let us. <laughs> APC wins all seats in Yobe Council poll. Refrain from issues you know nothing about, Atiku tells Shetema. Naira devaluation impacting positively on exports, according to customs. Seraph sues federal government over failure to account for loans by ex-presidents. Oando contributes $550 million out of $925 million for NNPCL's project Gazelle. UN group urges governments to take lead in education development. At the top of the paper, we have... Tinubu okays mandate for special envoy on climate action. Northern elders ask federal government to set up national pastoralist commission. Wow. And the final one, troops eliminate 11 terrorists in Abia, Zamfara, others. I think we should start off with Serap suing federal government over failure to account for loans by ex-presidents because that's a conversation that we had earlier today. Serap is saying that there is no transparency with regards how the loans in the past administrations have been spent and have been disbursed. So they're asking this current administration, I think it was on Friday, they sued, you know, they filed this in the high court. I think that uh, the one that would be so exciting for me to, to see how courts and pro judicial pronouncements will reveal how it was expended was the one, the $22.6 billion on China Nexim um, Bank, export bank by, obtained, you know, by former President Mahmoud Buhari and um, were stamped, you know, without any form of debate by the Lawan led Lawan, yes. Senate. And and I'm saying this not because I want to polarize the country more. But I want people to see the breakdown of the the loans by the federal government, that how they were going to spend that loan. Not a not a cent, a project of a cent was yeah. allocated to Southeast as a region. Not a project what a cent was allocated to that region. And so much that uh, you probably want to say NTA. NTA got $200 million or so out of that was meant to get $200 million. 200, was it $200 million? Yeah, $200 million for upgrade. No, $500 million for upgrade. I don't yeah. know if we saw that, if that happened. There were even some um, addings for like um, West Africa, livestock, blah, blah, um, cassava or whatever, you no know, maize in that, in that, in that, in that budget, uh, in that um, spending. So I want that to be looked into. When you, because you can't just, you can't just, you know, plunge Nigerians and the future of, you know, the future of those, you know, still in heaven into huge debt and you cannot account for it. And you know, that should be looked into. No, but, but, I mean, where is, where is the, key problem? Is it, you know, just lack of a proper auditing process or is this just the way things work in Nigeria where you take loans in billions of dollars and, you know, create frivolous um, uh, um, reasons, you know, where the money is allo allocated to, including the Humanitarian Affairs Ministry. I remember that, you know, the loans also were directed there. Um, uh, there was also loans uh, or the so 800 million, I believe, that was also used for palliative distribution at some point. This is some of the things that we've heard lately. You know, it's it's so sad that um, when we have these people in government, they go for these loans and they don't even look at, they don't prioritize things. If you are obtaining loans to keep Nigeria safe and Nigeria is, is as good as Dubai when it comes to infrastructure, yes, I'll clap for you. Exactly. But you obtain these loans and some other people just, you just, just like, you just, they just open their, not even pocket, their Ghana must go and just pack it in it and just move out of office. And it's sad. We can't point out to any infrastructural development that those loans, you know, gave us in the last 10, 15 years. I mean, the, are we the going trains, to still, are I we guess, still... the Abuja Kaduna trains and... and the Abuja other. Kaduna train was completely done and dusted by PDP and Jonathan. Even the one we, we commissioned by this administration was, was, was running, was suspended because of COVID. The one we are celebrating and... No, no, we, some people are celebrating and clapping for Wiki. It was done and dusted. Okay. Um, I mean, like you said, and I think that's the position a number of us agree with, that taking loans is not a bad thing, right? Is it, what exactly is the, are the loans that you're taking, what are they used for? You know, how can you account for this? But I want us to quickly move away from there and uh, touch on other papers. We would go around as many papers as we can today. 
Uh, let's go. Do you want to take the... Yeah, yeah. On, on the punch, I think it's something to, you know, to also speak about on the punch. The big story saying fuel and food foods lead as import hit 12 trillion naira. Manufacturers import 1.5 trillion naira raw materials. Food imports gulps 921 billion naira. Um, and, and, and my concern with this is not the figures. The figures are staggering, you know, enough, you know, but my concern really is the fact that this is where we are today. And I do not know that the current administration has said to itself that in the next four years, we would like to reduce the importation of certain food, you know, um, produce because we want to be self-sufficient. We want to improve mechanized agriculture across the country. We want to give farmers, you know, you know, freedom to produce these these goods so that we can then, you know, you know, start start local production of them. All right. Before but you respond, th to those that. conversations don't exist. Yeah. Yeah, but is you want to say something, Adi? Yeah, we want to quickly take a call. We have a uh, Abdullahi calling from Kaduna. Let's quickly take that call. And then we'll have you respond to that. Abdullah, good morning and thank you for calling. Please go ahead with your comments. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, I really want to commend uh, the effort you guys are putting in the studio. The lady and the gentleman, you guys are really doing a good job. Thank you very um, much. I really appreciate that. And uh, my comment is about what the NLC are fighting for. So I feel like each time they fight for increment in the minimum wage, it goes on to, increase, to to bring about inflation. And it's not everybody that works with the government or the private sector. You see a lot of, majority of Nigerians are running their own little businesses. So if you increase that minimum wage, it won't affect them in any way. In, in, in reverse, things will go up and then they will not even... Um, Benefit from it. So what I'm what I'm suggesting, as someone who doesn't work with the government, is the NLC should fight the government in order to reduce the cost of living. Today in Nigeria, if crude oil is if well, should be reduced to like 200 naira per liter, it will affect everybody. Everyone will benefit from that. Compare that to increment of minimum wage that. It's not everybody that works with the government. So if they should also gas, cooking gas should also be reduced to the bare minimum. These are yeah. the things that they should concentrate on. Because we can't continue hiking prices of things and then inflation keep going up. I don't think it should take us anywhere. All right, so it should I'm for the government to reduce the cost of living. I think that will go a long way. All right. Even the taxes. The school, the school fees, they should be reduced. That way, everybody will benefit from it. All right, Abdullah, thank you so much for calling and sharing your thoughts. All right. on that. I think we should, also, we should let Abdullah know that um, the minimum wage act or law yeah, to place that at, I think, three, five, four years. At some five point, years. Three years, but now they've you amended to five years. It should be reviewed upwardly. Upward. And so that tells you that in every growing economy, there's inflation. The value of the dollar in 1979 in America is not the same value as we speak today, because a lot of things comes to please, you know, comes to be a population explosion and what have you. So it's a normal thing that there will be inflation, whether you like it or not. But what you, what people, you know, advocate for is a minimum rate, a single digit um, inflation rate, three to five percent, which is good for your economy yeah. and your population good. That's what we should be looking at. And I think not, should, not 33 or 40. No, then there's nothing you should know. The organized private sector is also involved in this negotiation with labor. It's, the organized private sector is not bound by labor's argument or arrangement, but at least they should come. They should give their people something sensible and reasonable. Yeah. And to respond to what Osama right, said, just before you, apologies, just before um, Usman. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you today? Very well. Go ahead quickly. Yes. Um, I just have a little contribution. Uh, Good morning once again. Uh, my concern is this. Um, I want to make uh, just a little contribution. Now, at the national level, every all arms of government is supposed to make sacrifice. Sacrifice in the sense that the National Assembly, with all this huge money, can sacrifice part of this money they are taking voluntarily. I expect Akpapio, the Senate President, to talk to his colleagues they can equally make adequate contribution like that. And Nigeria should be addressed. All the newspaper allowances, all this big, huge money that they take. Newspaper allowance can be of one month alone, can pay about 10 people's salary. Just that is one month for you. 
please, this is my own contribution. I just want sacrifice, yeah. please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he does have a fair point, you know, that you know, the government came into, off, you know, into office and, of course, one of the things that they said was that Nigerians need to tighten their belts, make some sacrifices, but none of them, not one of these people, has made one inch of a sacrifice. I, I think it's, it's, it's quite insensitive to be wicked of all Nigerians just to focus on the National Assembly. And I guess this um, blackmail of National Assembly, permit me to use that word, it's... Yeah, okay, yeah. Let's, it's let's not just so. So it's not just, just the national, national assembly. assembly. We're talking about sacrifice. We're talking about general. I know, but sacrifice. Unfortunately, not, national assembly is just the very first. Yeah, the people still, you that, know, yeah. uh, you know, that was encouraged by um, the, pres the, the administration of um, former president Mahmoud Buhari. That everybody felt the circuit led national assembly was not, you know, was the, you know, the hindrance to us yes. um, against Buhari giving us good governance, and you know, we saw that it was not. And even during, during that time, we saw they moved, scrapped the Senate. Not even the hassle, not the national assembly. So it's it's bad and it's not good for us as a country just to focus on one arm of government. The, the executive are the ones that we should even scrutinize more. If you look at the budget of the state house, you will cry for this country. Some ridiculous ed, um, edings there, some ridiculous spendings there. And it's year in, year out. I know it would have been increased because the last time I checked, the yearly you know, the allocation for yearly renewal of software was 200 million now, as far back as 2016. And software doesn't get upgraded every yearly. It's like 24 months. So you look at that, and it's just copy and paste. And you still pay the budget office for preparing that budget of the state house. So back to what Osama said. I think it, um, it shows the, it exposed the, the insincerity of this president's administration because at some point they promised us food security. The president directed that they should open the reserves and bring out grains. Yeah. And if you are still importing foods as much as one point something trillion, where was the, where, so where are the reserves that the government ordered people to, you know, the Minister of Agri to open up and give things out to Nigerians? So it shows that the food security is still far away from us. We can't be self-sufficient if we don't deal with insecurity and the rising cost of energy, which includes, you know, which preservation, transportation of um, produce from farms to the market. Yeah. Because to get something down from Kano, Niger, Benue to Lagos or other parts of the country, it comes at a very huge cost. All right, let's yeah, uh, take a call from Ebo in state. We have Prince Igwe calling. Good morning. Thank you for calling. Please go ahead with your comment. Good morning. Nice having you here. So I want to contribute to when we talk about the... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, a lot needs to be done when it comes to transportation. Um, this thing has not been taken serious. A lot of drivers, we, I'm into transport. I'm the chairman of return at one state. But we pay enough tax to the federal government that at the end of it, we will not get anything. The well is high. No matter how much you put into agriculture in the country, and the, 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 the taxes are not being regulated the way it's supposed to be. It will not need any good thing. We pay a lot of taxes to operate from one, one state to another. You, each state you enter, you pay tax as if you are not from the country. You will see a group of people from nowhere coming to the federal highway asking for taxes. And when you put all these things into the movement, you will see that it's adding to the high cost of the, the food in the country. And nobody has taken it away. We are part of labor's uh, organization. But we are not being recognized in any way in the country. Any corner you enter, you see somebody trying to stop you. Even the people on the road, even sometimes the, the, the law enforcement agencies. All this money has been given to, to the uh, petty traders. And nobody talks about it. And we are talking about minimum wage. Yes, even though the money is being increased, and nothing is being done into the transport sector, because I've never seen. Any economy that wants to progress that doesn't talk, uh, take care of their transport system, the money will see and uh, people will still be suffering. Yeah. And it is a problem in this country. Yeah. The, the presenters and even the uh, analysts in there, you will witness what I'm saying that you, people pay from one post and nobody recognizes drivers in the country. We have no minimum wage, we have no, uh, we have no gratuity, we have nothing. Yeah, all right. Nothing. 
All right, uh, Prince Igwe, thanks for sharing. He, he also, of course, you know, has his own concerns, um, which, you know, I recognize. You know, he doesn't think that, you know, there's enough conversations concerning the welfare of drivers across the country. Um, I'm sure everybody would say this. You know, everybody in, in almost all the fields in the country would say the same thing. Healthcare workers would say the same thing. You know, Nigerian railway workers would say the same thing, everybody. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he also got to, to pour that out. Let's go on. Yeah, but so back to what we were saying, and to buttress this point, you probably if you travel, if you join in Lagos, Benue, yeah, you see a lot of um, the constant nuisance on the road, asking you for a, different kinds of levies and issuing receipts for a lot of things from radio tax to this and that, and he, he has a point, and the gov and you find that those things are not regulated. Some people are just fleecing Nigerians and some people are just smiling to the bank. So we need to look at a lot of things. And back to this issue. And the issue of um, fall importation in there still shows you that we're still paying subsidy. Whether they like it or not. Just to, because if you look at the coin to exchange rate and look at the pump price of um, PMAs yeah. across the country, there's a form of subsidy because it doesn't tally. So the government should come out clean. Well, they've denied it. They've told us that, you know, no, we shouldn't say what Please, we do. please, don't, don't call that a denier because that is an, that's an affront on our intelligence. Because the, the, the reporter was like, yes, it was a draft. It, didn't, it wasn't an official document. So that means that memo was real, but because it hasn't been signed official. Yeah. Then secondly, he said there was no provision for subsidy in 2024 budget. But he didn't speak to the argument or the allegations that he paid so much for subsidy in 2023. So that thing was an unintelligent attempt at, at uh, probably bamboozing or hypnotizing Nigerians. Yeah. All oh. right. Um, I want us to still look at this Nigerian newspaper, front page of this Nigeria. There's a story there um, talking about MDA struggling to pay salaries over 50% operating surplus deduction. Um, trade associations, workers want policy reversal. Experts urge federal government to pay policy at 20% in first instance. Policy introduced to regain one trillion naira yearly loss, says federal government. Well, yes. Okay, please go ahead. I don't know why uh, a lot of MDAs might be struggling to pay salaries, and because you, you ask yourself, I think it's it's the laziness of successive governments when you talk about job creation and how to reduce unemployment. The only thing they think of is open up the civil service, both at state, local, state, and federal level. That's what we're paying for. You find some some people that have no business to be in the civil service. That's true. That's the truth. And you have some process or departments or operations in the civil service that should be automated as we speak. But because they just want to keep some people on the job, it's not being done. So that's why we have. I I, I pray we get it right as a country. And and I pray successive governments don't just pay lip service um, to small, medium scale enterprise, they probably look at it so well because that's the only thing that will sustain this economy with our growing population. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think we can quickly throw in the Vanguard. I'm not sure if you took uh, uh, stories from the Vanguard before, but let's quickly just put the Vanguard on screen and, uh, and show our viewers. Uh, stories that says, experts see danger around minimum wage battle. Um, will, of course, you know, they go back on strike or not? You know, should the conversation change into reduction in the cost of living instead of an increase in minimum wage? Would the federal government, you know, maybe move to 100,000 naira or not? Uh, you know, these are things that we we'll find out this week. Basic education, why UB Act must be reviewed. Senate, UBEC boss and others are saying. Also, top of the screen, airfares, prices skyrocket, distort travel plans. Uh, how Jonathan, wife and others forced Wiki on river, says Clark. We can also find a financial crisis. Disco's pay 21.9 billion for 235 billion worth of um, uh, electricity. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And also, gunmen ab abducted 30 passengers in Nasarawa. OB mocks INEC. South Africa elections didn't experience glitches. But that's also something I think we probably should speak you know, ab about. The you know, South African elections you know, and comparing you know, what happened in Nigeria in 2023 with what South Africa did a few weeks ago. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reaction, you know, of people like Peter Obi and other people who, who have said, you know, that, you know, the giant of Africa completely disgraced itself in its elections. Uh, you see, uh, it's, um, I don't think uh, Mahmoud, the chairman of INEC, should still have the moral rights or probably the confidence to speak 
when we talk about elections or the, when we critique or probably question the conduct of the 2023 general elections, what they should do or what they should be doing is apologizing to Nigerians. And if they want to give him another chance, you know, he probably should do it right. You saw how he was, you know, thumping his chest, saying this and saying that, and everything he said he was going to do, he didn't do. Everything that I said was going to happen under his, um, his watch and leadership didn't happen. And that was what made the 2023 election keenly disputed by a lot of people, you know, strongly disputed by a lot of people. It's a, if you can't, if people don't have a sense of fairness in, your, in the electoral process, then you cannot inspire them to believe in the government that emerges from such a um, process. And they, that government will have difficulty in moving the country forward. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a chain reaction. So I think INEC, if INEC really wants this country to grow, if, politic, if the political class really wants this country to grow, they should allow the electoral system to you know, play, out, play itself out you know, nicely, truthfully, sincerely, and you know, transparently. It, I mean, isn't it embarrassing you know, that even at, you know, at, in 2023, we still had that very, very archaic method of result collation? We still had you know, that very, it still looked like we were in 1992. You see, it, um, it shows you this. And this is after 300 billion naira had been allocated for the elections. You will probably find out that some politicians will resist it because, it, because I tell people, election is about, it's a popularity contest. If you've done so well, you don't even need to muzzle or strangulate the process or the system to get back into office. Everybody will just know that it's a no-brainer, you're going to get re-elected. But because they know they've not served the interest of the people, they have to circumvent the process to get themselves back. So, Every policies, every amendment that probably will make the electoral process seamless, you know, transparent, will be resisted by this political class because right. they are not there to serve our interest. Yeah. All right. Before we take the next story, uh, let's take this call from Kaduna. Good morning and thank you very much for calling. Please go ahead, Samuel. All right, we've lost that call, unfortunately. Still on the front page of The Punch, EU raises Schengen visa fee to 90 euros. So I decided to quickly go look for that story I was telling you about and mm -hmm. I found it. And the headline, you know, did read, and this time around it's on the Vanguard, it said, Jack, but Nigerians spent over 3 million euros on rejected Schengen visa applications in 2023 alone. The EU government globally garnered 130 million euros from such rejections with African and Asian countries bearing 90% of the cost, as reported by EU Observer. Now, these figures, however, do not account for additional costs incurred from missing travel opportunity, missed travel opportunities for businesses and leisure, or the expenses related to legal advice and private agencies involved in visa processing. So we're seeing, okay, let's quickly take this call before you come back to react to that. We have JJ calling from Lagos. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Please go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Please continue with your comment. Okay, so uh, on the issue of minimum wage, I don't know if our political leaders buy from the system market that the ordinary Nigerians buy. Everything has gone up from electricity bills to tomato to paper to oil to beans. Everything that somebody needs to take to survive has gone up. And they are still talking about minimum wage of 2000 and governors are saying they can't afford to pay. But they are living large like they make us. They are living in billions on daily basis. They didn't want the country to burn down for them to continue in power. They didn't have human chips at all. All right. Somebody need to break it to their doorstep. Let them understand what the people are going through in this country. All right, JJ. All right. Thank you very much for calling. And I don't sure know that, that the you. average senator, you know, gives Understand. his wife uh, uh, monthly market shopping money. And you, you know, know and, the, the and, most and insensitive, and you know, ultras <laughs> during this conversation is um, George Akume. Saying Say that they are um, e economic uh, sabotage. No, no, he cannot, he cannot afford to, to pay, pay his, his, his four, four drivers. drivers. Yeah, that was, that was right. I'm like, so that means four drivers. Oh, why four? People, people are trying to eat here. We're talking of four drivers. Right. What are the four drivers for? One for him, one for the wife, maybe one for the kids. And one for the, the, stand, one for the standby car. Yeah. All right. I, I, think, I wanted to, okay. Yeah, please go ahead. I wanted you to quickly react to this story because why it's a, an important story to have is how we're seeing these visa inequalities, right? We're seeing how a number of countries are making a lot of money from these. And it will not stop because people are trying to leave the country over and over again. And I don't know what we can do and how we can get to a point where 
we don't have to spend so much and maybe something can be done to ensure that there are countries i believe it's japan or so that when they reject your visa they return your money shouldn't that be something no, we japan is one is just one unique country that's just full of even in the approach of the government itself look at the policies as if they are just like gentlemen in everything they do so i don't you you probably can't fault japan but you see uh why it's not just about EU. a lot of countries make money and i think if we're looking what to we can is we can also cash in into that uh, you know market that pool of resources but what do we have to sell kenya well, is making they've complained a... about our visa fees in all fairness but it's not i yeah, don't know that pretty high visa fees yeah no but, but what is that what is the attraction it's just only for businessmen that come in with briefcase and go back with you know funds out of the country that will probably will not mind paying such but look at kenya kenya is not just about government patronage or contractors coming to kenya there's tourism in kenya mauritius is growing as well we should look at but Nigeria, we've not dealt with insecurity. Exactly. We can't have we can't we can't cash in on these things. So yeah. it's people want to, you know, my, migration is a common thing in human nature. Even from days of the Bible, Holy Quran, you find people migrating. Even the traditional worshippers, they will tell you or go move from one place to the other, or women move from one place to the other. So migration has been in existence, predates this, you know, this generation. And people always want to move to where they feel they can have excel more. Pastures. Not just if they can even be better than themselves, they can express themselves better than they have in their present location. Yeah. So I, I think that just, just to have a way to be part of the market. Yeah. All right. This is, I mean, for me, from the stories that we've seen so far, you know, it's been one year plus, and the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, it doesn't seem like, you know... It should get better, yeah, possibly. I, I feel like, you know, every government comes into, you know, office and everybody just understands that, there are certain things that would always be, you know, this way would always well, start like, to school. Yeah, start to school, you know. So just, you know, stay there for four years, stay there for eight years and go. You know, there's no need trying to fix anything. Well, Jamie Saka, thank you very much. Let's, um, let's, let's just keep hoping. I won't say praying. Let's keep hoping that we get it right as a nation. Well, yeah. the agenda is a renewed hope now. So yeah. we can't stop hoping. Well, we need hope, but not having hope that this, this renewed hope will help us. Thanks for going through another very sad um, newspaper front pages this morning. I know it's been like that for a no while. Yes, it's oh, been no, like no, it's been, been like that for a while, you know, usually. Yes. <laughs> but then again, there's also the perspective of his negative news that always hits the news first or goes farther. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of negative news we've seen lately. Yeah. But anyway, we'll come back to more of these conversations. And thank you to our callers who have joined us virtually. We'll go on a very quick break. And when we come back, we have more conversations this morning on Breakfast Central. Welcome once again. The current Nigerian government seems to be the most tone-deaf government we've had in recent times. Because of all the things Nigeria in its current state needs to spend money on. If a serious government has taken a look at the current state of affairs and truly is keen on working on a better life for its citizens. If that government, for example, put together a 100 item list, I'm sure that the serious government wouldn't find space to put 21 billion naira for the vice president's residence on that list. Just imagine, put together a list of the top 50 things that Nigeria needs currently, urgently. I'm sure that there wouldn't be any space if we had a serious government to put 21 billion naira in for the vice president's residence. But the government in Nigeria today continues to show Nigerians very clearly that its priority is in the Nigerian people. This ladies and gentlemen, is renewed hope. There's no way in logical terms that this project can be defended by any person, but with renewed hope, they don't even bother to give you a good explanation for, you know, for why this is. What they've simply said is, and of course I'm going to be quoting the Vice President and the Minister of the FCT, yes, on Wiki, he says, this project was awarded in 2010, 14 years ago, and was abandoned in 2014. It was in January this year, in 2024, that we had to review the project to 21 billion naira from 7 billion naira. And that means an additional 14 billion naira. He goes on to say for our vice president's residence to take 14 good years, and then Mr. President, within a year, made it a reality. This is what is called renewed hope. Now, it goes on to say that President Tinubu explained that the provision of a suitable residence for the vice president is not merely a matter of convenience, but also a symbol of respect for the office and the individual who occupies it. Again, this 
is what we see as renewed hope. And the thing here is, the Honorable Minister of the FCT sees this as something that Nigerians should applaud them for, for complete, completing an unfinished project. He's proud of it. He's excited to tell you that, you know, they, they've, they've finished this project in one year. But this is the same government that told Nigerians to tighten their belts. And the same Nigerians have had to make completely insane sacrifices just to survive current realities. The same government does the complete opposite, has no, you know, no thought in itself to hold back when it's time to spend billions and billions of Naira. In what way in any universe is spending 21 billion Naira on the vice president's residence beneficial to the Nigerian people? Why does Nigeria need that residence currently? And calling this a waste of money, the re of course, calling the whole project a waste of, waste of money, goes to show Nigerians exactly what this government has in its renewed hope agenda. More and more waste of the country's resources. Now, not only is the renewed hope wasteful in mind-blowing proportions, it is also very proud and loud when they waste Nigeria's money. It's only in Nigeria that you see the president or vice president and other top government officials leave their official duties to go and cut ribbon at the opening of a house. You wouldn't see this anywhere else in the world. And it shows clearly that these people are not busy. They have their priorities very, very twisted. One would expect that when such a, an expense is brought to the National Assembly or Mr. President's table, they will look at it and say, no, not right now, because Nigeria needs every available penny to be redirected into healthcare and education, security, and other more important issues. That's what you would expect in a country that knows that it doesn't have money to waste. But Nigeria has money to waste. The Nigerian government has money to waste. The Renewed Hope Agenda has billions of Naira to waste. Don't be fooled. And so it is in my view that we need to stop trying to remind the presidency about the sufferings of Nigerians. Stop this whole talk about, oh, Mr. President needs to be made aware that Nigerians are going through a lot. Because don't be deceived. It's not that they are not aware. They just have other things that they are focused on in the, in the interim. Good morning, Nigerians. Very thought-provoking piece there. Now we move to another story. According to a video for footage posted on X, at least 10 Nigerian girls between uh, 15 and 18 years have been rescued in Ghana after allegedly being trafficked for prostitution. The video footage shows the girls recounting their experiences, stating they were deceived by a relative and had their phones confiscated. The suspected trafficker who has now been arrested admitted to receiving 200 Ghana CDs, that's approximately 20,000 naira or $14 daily, from the girls' exploitation. Meanwhile, the Minister of Women Affairs and Social Development, Uju Kennedy Ohane, has warned hotel owners and managers across the country not to harbor underage girls in their facilities or risk being sanctioned. Joining us now is author and founder of the Preserved Childhood Foundation, Linda Nodiogo. Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. Morning, Molly. Uh, this, this is a very heartbreaking conversation to have, but uh, how deeply rooted is the problem of trafficking in Nigeria? How, I mean, we, we see it play out in different forms. Some of the time, they are trafficked for labor. Other times, they're trafficked for prostitution. But give us a picture, if you can, of how very deeply rooted or how much of a problem we as a country have to face when it comes to conversations about trafficking. Oh, well, we have a very big problem in Nigeria, especially currently with the rise in poverty, which is a major contributing factor to human trafficking. <laughs> so right, the, 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 the statistics is at an all-time high, doubled with insecurity, which a lot of areas in the country is currently facing. So be it human organ trafficking, um, for child labor, or sex, tra or sex trafficking. So it's a big issue now. And the major contributing factor is the hardship in the country and insecurity. I mean, but uh, there would always be, you know, some level of hardship and insecurity, you know, but um, to have these girls of these ages, we're talking young teenagers now in other countries, you know, in this particular case in Ghana, you know, it shows that, you know, they went through a process. They were trans, you know, they were, they were trafficked through a certain process they were maybe deceived, you know, or something. So what do you think, you know, we are lacking, you know, in, in order to be able to prevent these things from happening? 
um, we are lacking awareness and education on this area. We are lacking a lot of awareness because most times these traffickers, they either, um, they either use force, coercion or fraud. In the case of those girls, they were told they were going to work. And because of the hardship in the country, everybody's looking for a way out. So these trafficking rings, they have their agents. And in their case, the person who trafficked them is a family member, is someone known to them. So because of the lack of awareness in our local communities, especially, it is a big problem because they, they go down there to the village. And it, most times it's not just international. This trafficking happens locally too. People go to rural areas and they pick up young girls and boys and they bring them to the, to the cities for cheap labor. So if because of this lack of information, which is a huge gap, especially in rural areas at least, this news has broken. Most people who are online have seen this news, but people in rural areas do not even see this news. Tomorrow, someone else is out there also exploiting them, exploiting people, giving them false information. And sometimes these girls are forcefully taken from their homes. So it is a huge problem. This, this, I think there needs, there is need for a social campaign to inform people, especially yeah. young girls, about this trafficking because women and children are more vulnerable to traffickers. Yeah. Do, do you have, a, you know, any um, figures, you know, as to the number of, maybe average number of Nigerian girls that are scattered across the continent, you know, currently being, you know, being used as, you know, sexual you know, slaves in different parts of the continent and maybe even outside the continent? I do not have a specific, I do not have a specific statistics, a figure for that at the moment. All right. Uh, well, it is okay, go ahead, sorry. Back. Say that again, please. I, I do not have a specific statistics or figure for the number of girls that are being sent out of the country, different parts of the world, because it's not just the continent, different parts of the world. And our, our borders are porous. Our security officials are, are, are corrupt. So... And most times, data is not being collected. The accurate data is not being collected. So you cannot really tell the actual number of girls that are being trafficked. All right, uh, we'll come back to talk about that. But let's talk about what exactly is driving this. Would you say that we have... Uh, I mean, some people would talk about poverty being a key player in this situation. Um, others would say it's beyond poverty. There's some element of greed that is involved here. So what would you say are some of the norms or behaviors that contribute to this issue? How can we as a society, you know, be held accountable? What are the things we need to look within and address to ensure, ensure that, you know, trafficking doesn't become the norm? Why poverty plays a part? I would agree that it form, some sort of greed also comes to play when it comes to trafficking. Because um, you check the kind of things they are told, these girls, and yes, a lot of them come from poor for um, families, or some of them are even runaways. They are vulnerable already. But greed in the sense that some of the things they are promises, some of the things they are promised is not something that is reachable or attainable. But because they want more, because they seek for more, they make them vulnerable to these things. Another thing is um, limited education and awareness. And migration, and like I talked about, insecurity. The social media is another platform that traffickers also use. They tend to, you know, show off a certain lifestyle that they want to use and lure these girls to want to belong to whatever it is they are doing. And then there is demand for cheap labor. Go out there in different homes. There are young children who are being, um, who are being used for cheap labor. And um, this is a major contributing factor because when there is no demand, there is no supply. So um, we need to really look into these factors that has made human trafficking become the order of the day. Well, I mean, if, if the demand and supply aspect, you know, is almost going to be impossible to, to completely take out. Um, it's not just Nigerians that are being trafficked. You know, there's, you know, human trafficking across the world, across the globe. Um, you know, what, what we, you know, must do in Nigeria is to reduce the numbers and to try to protect these young girls as much as possible. Um, so I want to talk about punitive measures, intelli intelligence gathering, um, and, you know, the uh, likelihood of arresting some of the people who perpetrate these things. Um, from family members who allow the uh, younger ones to be trafficked uh, to, of course, the traffickers themselves. It, you know, has there been any improvement in the process, in, 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 in arresting these uh, persons, in blocking these networks, you know, with which these girls are being trafficked lately? Um, I would say that we are a society that we react to news and most times you're not proactive to these things. Every day we hear breaking news of these things, but most times it is when it has happened. And now that we've reacted to this news, I don't think um, 
the required investigation is carried out to ensure that this, from this person, this trafficker that has been caught, if proper investigation is done, other trafficking rings will be discovered. So I think the government and our policymakers need to look into this. Currently, it is, uh, I think the sentence is between five years to life imprisonment. But most of the time, these people are let out of prison after five years to continue what they are doing. So I think we need stronger laws and our security agencies need to be educated. They need to even be more to ensure that they are doing what needs to be done to ensure these traffickers do not carry on their activities with impunity in our society. Then I think local communities, um, religious leaders and traditional rulers should be also put um, involved with the activities of NAPTIP, which is the um, National Association for Prohibition of Human Trafficking of Persons. So I think all these things need to be put in place. The corruption in our security agency, amongst our security agencies it's very very important that that is addressed because most times they see these girls being moved in their numbers and they don't ask questions once they are bribed so it is a big problem okay now let's talk about support now we've we've just heard the news about the girls who have been rescued and will be returned to nigeria shortly would you say that we have um systems that strongly support those girls their rehabilitation some form of trauma support to help them heal through the trauma they've been through and rehabilitate them into society I want to point out that the first mistake that has been made is showing off the faces of these girls. Their faces are trending already on social media, and that's like the first mistake. When you're trying to rehabilitate someone, you do not put out their image online. Okay, so I think that's something we need to address when news like this break out to protect the identity of these girls. And um, yes, there might be a few um, girls for rehabilitation for them, but most times it is not. Um, it is not long-standing. As they are brought home to Nigeria, a few things, you know, meet, meet and greet, all those things. And next thing, they are sent home. They are sent home to that poverty that drove them to this point at, in the first place. And you find that a lot of these girls get re-victimized. So I think um, something needs to be set up to reorientate these girls for proper counseling. Because of these girls, are used, they are, they've been used for sex, as sex workers. So there really needs to be reorientation and counseling for, this, for the survivors. And some form of employment or empowerment. For them so that they do not need to go back or they will not be victimized in things like this yeah um yeah, is uh, just to you know share you know some statistics you know that i uh, you found the um government of nigeria investigated 1242 cases of human trafficking including 511 sex trafficking cases 282 labor trafficking cases the government also identified 1634 victims including 841 sex trafficking victims and 500 and uh, 43 um, uh, victims. Um, it's also initiated prosecutions of 78 suspects, 67 for sex trafficking and 11 for labor trafficking. So it's a mess. It's a complete mess. You know, and, you know obviously NAPTIP and um, other um, um, uh, bodies need to, of course, you know, step in to help reduce this. But, you know, our borders are porous. Uh, the illegal migration is still a thing that happens, you know, in, in, in Nigeria. And you know, these are things that still need to be tackled. Are there male victims? Can you share with us, you know, if there's also, you know, uh, victims, the male child, victims of uh, trafficking? Yes. While women and, and girls are more um, vulnerable to trafficking, of course, male, there are male victims. A lot of them, the hawkers you see on the streets, even in and outside um, Nigeria and our neighboring um, African countries, these young boys are also trafficked. For different reasons, even for sexual exploitation. Yes, most times we think it's just the girls. The boys too. They are used as sex slaves in different parts of the world. So the boys are also part of this statistic. While the girls and the women are more, the boys are, and even men, even men, anybody can be trafficked. Some people of different gender and different ages. Remember, it is about um, coercion. It is about fraud, coercing people to do um, certain things against their wish. And most times they are told they are going out of the country. When um, our people were brought back from Libya, we can see that it was people, both male and female. They are promised better life out there. And when they get there, their passports are seized. And at the end of the day, they are used uh, for cheap labor. But most times, they are not paid at all. So yes, even the men and the boys are part of it. OK. All right. Um, Linda Unodiogu, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, we look forward to seeing better strides being taken, uh, especially when it comes to conversations about trafficking, and less of us young people being trafficked. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. All right. Thank you very much for joining us on today's broadcast. By the time we're back tomorrow, we should have some form of uh, feedback regarding what uh, organized labor has decided. We're hoping to see that
There will be some positive feedback regarding their negotiation with the federal government. But until we come your way again, I am Olive Emodi. And also hoping for brighter stories in the newspapers tomorrow. Hopefully, you know, Tuesday brings something better. But we'll wish you a very productive Monday ahead. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I am Osao Gye Ogmawa. See you tomorrow.